you're about to see a video because of the technology and when it was filmed, you have to lean in with your ears and, and listen, and more importantly, listen with your heart. There are things that are in all of our lives that trouble us. There are fearful moments. There are situations and circumstances that are outside of our control. Uh, maybe it's your health or it's marriage or how you see the economy today or you see politics, whatever it might be. But the story that you're going to hear of a man who would take his family to West Africa and then the terrorists come in on that dreadful day and murder Mike. And then the story of Amy and Amy and Mike going to West Africa as partners in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the injustice that was done to her to go back to lean into that space. So my prayer this morning is we would just open up our hearts and that we would move from thinking that Mike and Amy are extraordinary, and you certainly are extraordinary, how you have impacted my life. I told the first gathering, people often say, you know, Mark, why are you so passionate? Can't you dial it back a little bit? And they go, my goodness, son, why does it always have to be you're all on? Well, this this family challenged me and uh, it's real easy to get into a North American rhythm um, and so you're going you're gonna to hear, hear that story but what I said to Amy earlier as I looked at Mike's picture, Mike's picture sits right out in front of our cafe is that Mike and Amy their story isn't extraordinary, it becomes ordinary and we lean into that space. And wherever it is that you work or play or go to school or do your business or vacation, that we would live for Christ. And no matter what might come against us, even death itself, it would be for gain. Tonight we are learning more about the victims and survivors of a terror attack. What do you fear? I mean, what are you scared of? Everyone seems to be scared of something. What are you scared of? Because... That fear is affecting your life. Mike moved with Amy and their two daughters in 2011 to start an orphanage. That fear may be keeping you from coming and seeing us in Africa. Mike and a pastor were at the cafe in the country's capital to meet new volunteers. The pastor later called Amy after escaping. Gunmen came into the restaurant shooting and everyone ran to hide. The pastor somehow had Mike's phone and called, wrote Amy. It was still unclear if Mike survived. God is doing some fantastic things with us because we were able to move beyond the fear. If we lost everything, even our own lives, we gained everything in heaven. This is something to look forward to. Can you live your life like that? Philippians 1.21 says, for, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I now get that. I now understand that. And I embrace that. I love that. How cool is our God if He can give us this, that if we die, this is gain. What else do I have to be afraid of? The question for us is, what are you afraid of? And how can you look fear in the face and win, coming out victorious no matter what you face? in life. And in a world of injustice, who could ever serve in the very place that their loved one was murdered? Today, we have the privilege of hearing from a woman who knows what it means to experience loss, to face fear, and not allow that fear to rob her of being who God made her to be. Would you help me welcome Amy to the stage? Thank you. 
It is a privilege to have you with us today, Amy. And six years ago, Mike graduated to heaven. You have stayed in the country where your husband gave his life. First, how are you? And give us an update on your family. Um, I'm doing great. Um, I'm going to be here in, for a couple of months uh, visiting with family, and everything's been really great. I'm so happy to be able to be here. It's been a while since before COVID, uh, so it's really good to be here. Um, my girls, I've got uh, four kids, uh, two girls, the ones that were mentioned that came with us over to Africa. They are now uh, here in the United States. Uh, Delaney is married. She lives in Seattle. And um, Haley is living in Nashville, and I hear that there may be an engagement this year. Uh, and then we had taken in two children in um, Africa, and uh, they are uh, Moise and Biba, and they've, been, they've visited here before, so if you've been here to see them in um, past times. Uh, Biba, she is um, taking a test tomorrow and um, Tuesday. This is her uh, exit exam for high school. It's pass fail, so if you can remember to keep her in your prayers, this is a very big deal. Um, Moise is here. He's in children's ministry right now. Moise is doing great. After we left the last time, we found out Moise needed some surgeries. And so all those surgeries are complete. The last one in September of 2020 to repair a hole in his heart. Uh, his cardiologist appointment we just went to, they said everything's great. They don't need to see him for another year. Yay, that's amazing. <laughs> and even better, the, the last time I was here, we were talking about praying for Moses' adoption. Well, I'm happy to say that also Moses' adoption is complete and final. <laughs> Woohoo! That's awesome. <laughs> Very exciting. Um, you know, Amy, what some would say watching this video, getting to know your story, what some would say you've lost, you've stayed. You're literally leveraging your life, partnering with people to discover in Christ we have hope. So emotionally, how do you move beyond fear and live in this posture of gaining everything in Christ? Um, well, first, what, after Mike died, this kind of thing had never happened before. So I didn't really have a thought that this is something that could happen to me because I thought this was like an isolated case. Um, more so what I was going through at that moment was I had just lost my love of my life, my partner in life, my partner in ministry, and how was I going to continue without him, continue alone? But then I remembered I've, I, we've never been alone. God has been with us the whole time. And as much pain as I was in, it was my moment to kind of walk in the wilderness with God, to lean on him, to trust him, and just take one step at a time that he laid out before me. Um, now, since, things have gotten a lot worse. So um, pretty much there is an attack happening in our country every day, sometimes um, two, sometimes even three attacks happening. Uh, the security situation has deteriorated so much. We've got over 2 million people displaced um, in the country. And again, I use those same principles. The Lord is with me. I just lean on him. And I have faith in him, and I just take those steps one at a time. Wow. And I love what you just shared, too, because often, as we've talked, we can make following God and having faith pretty complicated, yeah. but it's really not. Choosing faith over fear is what you just shared. It's, I'm going to be in this day and trust God with this open-handed posture of whatever he has for me right now. You know, you're serving in so many different ways in West Africa, and one of those ways was a new program literally launched this past month, Widow Village. Tell us about this. Okay, so um, I have to start by talking about a dream that we had. It was a big dream on my husband's heart of extending the growing season. Since it only rains about three months, uh, the people are only able to grow their crops during that time, and so that really does affect what they have as far as food for the rest of the year. Um, one of those ways was um, aquaponics. We had met with somebody that said, I think that this could work, um, and so give that a try. Well, Mike had seen through drilling wells that being able to bring water, which is such a much-needed thing, gave you kind of the key to unlock a village that was not receptive to hearing about the gospel. And so this was another way that we were thinking, learn how to get this done train it to local pastors and a, a team so that they could bring it into villages and also bring the gospel. And in doing that, we built this village and it had, uh, ten, it's got 10 huts, it's a uh, compound, it's a pretty large piece of land and it actually sits on land that you can't really grow in. 
And that was the key. You can't grow on this land, so how are we gonna do, how are we gonna grow with the aquaponics and hydroponics and all of that? And we were inviting university students. We wanted university students that were studying um, agriculture and studying, um, uh, I'm trying to think, engineering, to be able to come out and build these things and challenge them with how do you build these things with just the materials that are available in the villages. And then after Mike passed, that dream had to be put on hold because now we are in a, a security situation. Now universities aren't gonna send their students to come and do these things. And so what are we going to do with this property that we have? And it was such a big piece of his heart and I just could not say, well, we're just gonna shut the doors on this. Um, over the last six years, we have had a caretaker out there taking care of animals. We've got cows and donkeys and rabbits and chickens. And what he has done though is there are children in the area and for some reason they just love this guy and whenever you go and you see him he's like got 20 children surrounding him and he has been able to like disciple and mentor children to where this last year six children have given their life to christ wow that's amazing <laughs> yeah. so now partner that with uh our women's center ministry where we take women in who've been abandoned or abused or young widows um, and they have no skills but now are faced with trying to take care of their families and so we have a program that's nine months long that gives them those skills. And every time we have a graduating class, a lot of them have a place to go back to, a field to grow food on, but we have usually one or two that don't have a place to go. And we try to find them a place, but it just like occurred that this is like an amazing opportunity. We have this land. So I approached the Women's Center director and I asked her about it and she said, this is a great plan. So less than two weeks ago, we had two women and their children move out to live in this uh, widow village is what we're calling it. Um, and it's not only gonna serve these ladies, but it's gonna be a place where if a pastor found a woman that was in need that just needed a place to stay for a while, you know, she also could be able to go and stay and she would have the community of these women. So this is a next step program for them. After, uh, they will stay probably about a year. They will start um, you know, practicing the skills that they learn and start earning money so that then they can move on. And then when the next graduating class of women comes, they'll have a place also to come and stay. That's incredible. And I love how you have even worded it recently where you had a plan and this plan did not unpack how you thought, but, and I quote, God's bigger plan showed up. And it's amazing to see how something that you designed this village for one purpose, right. God's purpose has been so much bigger. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny how you think you have all these plans and you're moving along and God has actually opened the door for these plans, but, but he has known all along from the very beginning what was going to unfold. And it is only until now where we saw his big plan unfold. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now you also recently shared the story of Salimata, mm -hmm. the first child in the Hope Host Family Program. So share with us about foster care program and adoption and what's happening. Okay, so I've been now um, in Africa for a little over 10 years. Uh, when we first arrived, that's our primary ministry is the orphanage. And we could see what a good ministry that is and how loved the children were and cared for and in a safe space. But what was always missing was children really need to be better served when they're with parents, with family. And so we started to do what we could to keep children actually from entering the orphanage if they could by coming alongside family to help them uh, with what they need to take care of their kids. And if that wasn't possible, well, we, we would look for families to adopt these children. But oftentimes there are children that are actually too old to adopt because we get, have children that are even our school age in the orphanage. Um, and they do have extended families, but for some reason or another, they can't be with them. In the case of Sali Mata, she uh, was in a village where they shut down schools. Terrorists came in and closed down schools. And there's probably over a thousand schools right now that have been closed. Her, she comes from a Muslim family, and the, her father had three wives and several children. He passed away, the school closed, and a social worker came to us and asked if, if she could have a place at the orphanage so she could continue going to school. And we had a woman at our church who said, I would love to have her come and live with me. And so that was actually the beginning of this program that we launched. So Salimata actually just a week ago gave her life to Christ and um, wow and and was baptized. <laughs> yes. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. 
So the host family program, um, we have years ago tried to connect children with families, um, and it just never seemed to work. It, it, in the culture, it seems that um, families are willing to take in extended family, but not really children that are not like their family. And so um, when, Sa when Salimato entered Fatih's home, then we said, this is the time, I think, to start talking to the church again and see if there are families that are willing to open up their hearts and homes to kids. And so one Sunday in September, um, the pastor had me speak to the church, and I just talked to them about um, how God loves the orphan and how, how does he love the orphan. It's through me and you. And how uh, Sheltering Wings, our center, has helped uh, many people in our congregation through jobs, through their children going to our school, through our medical clinic. And so they all are very familiar with what we do. But I had to tell them why do we want parents for these kids? Why do we want them in a host family? Um, because they could see that the orphanage was doing a good job taking care of the kids and that all their needs were being met. So I told them, I shared with them why I felt that they were better served in a family, a Christian family that can mentor them, that can guide them and give them the love that they need. And children are actually, if they're going to go back to their extended families, they are much better off coming from an African family going back into their family than being in an orphanage. And so I, I challenged them to sign up for a meeting the following Friday, um, not really expecting too many people because of past experience, but then I found out 13 families had signed up to find out more. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. So good. Yeah, so then that Friday night they came, and each one of those families heard about the program, and each one of them committed. They went through a, a training, and they are certified. Uh, currently, we have seven children placed. Stop. We, I love that. <laughs> we now have nine families that are certified and waiting for more children, and we believe because of the security situation and Families wanting to stay and work in their field, but sending their children away so they can attend school since the schools have been shut down, that we're going to have more kids and now they'll have a place. Wow. It's incredible to see how something you weren't sure how people were going to respond. And you then again, in that day, trusted God with what he was placing in your hands. And now all of these children who are finding hope and a home. Yeah. Um, you know, I know right now that there is a real need. You have a shortage of $2,000 a month from increased costs in hiring a doctor to be at the medical mm -hmm. clinic. Corn and milk is increasing in the cost. And, and so there's a need. Here in the States, due to inflation, some could think perhaps, well, now's the time to conserve, to not give as much. But perhaps now is the best time to give more. I want for you to just take a moment and unpack if someone was thinking about giving, thinking about making a difference, why does giving now, today, and not waiting help and make a difference? Um, the orphanage is our core ministry, and all the other ministries that have come out of that, they exist because of the orphanage. So if you were going to give to the orphanage, you're actually indirectly helping every one of our ministries. Um, as Emily said, the cost of food has gone up significantly. We did just have to hire a new doctor to continue with our clinic. It was something the government required of us and you all helped out with. Um, but also because of the insecurity, we've had to hire additional security. And so we are falling short and these kids need us. Um, everyone's gonna get one of these today. This is my prayer card, and so I'm hoping that you'll put it in a place where you remember to pray for the orphanage and, uh, and pray for me and the ministries, but on the back is also a way that you can connect by becoming a friend of the orphanage. And so this is a sponsorship program where you actually choose the amount you can give. So if you can give $500 a month or you can give $5 a month, each one of us can do our small part and together, collectively, we can make a huge, huge difference. Absolutely. You know, we began this conversation with a question, like, what are you afraid of? And Amy, through your story, we have seen how you are moving beyond fear, and you're choosing to be who God made you to be. Mm -hmm. Now, it could be easy for those of us who hear your story to say, well, that's, that's Amy. She can do that, but there's no way I could move past what I'm afraid of. What would you say to encourage us to literally walk and live faith over fear? Um, well, first I'll say that there's no better place to be than in the center of God's will. 
And uh, if God places something on your heart and you feel that nudge, he's going to be there with you to get you through that and to uh, follow along that path. Just as I said before, where I had to take that moment to know that I'm leaning on God, I'm trusting him, and I'm just taking one step at a time. If God places something on your heart to do, and it doesn't mean you have to move across the world because you can make such a significant um, impact right here in your own backyard, then you just have to know that God is with you and he's going to help you and just take that one step at a time. Mm, that's so powerful. Thank you. Can you help me thank Amy for sharing today? <laughs> <laughs> it is a privilege to have you Thank here. Thank you so much. Absolutely. You know, we've just heard how Amy literally is living faith over fear. We started this time with a question. So we're going to end with a question. How will you choose to not let your fear rob you from being who God made you uniquely to be? How will you make a difference with your one and only life? Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. Who is free indeed? I'm a child. Mike shared Philippians chapter 1. If you got your Bible or your digital device, uh, Philippians chapter 1. Uh, interesting, <clears throat> maybe you're familiar with this piece of scripture, maybe not so much. The Apostle Paul is imprisoned, so he's writing from a difficult space. Uh, he's been arrested on trumped up charges, he has been beaten, and he's in a prison cell when he writes these words, applicable then and applicable in our lives today. Here's what Mike shared. For me, and only you can answer that, right? For, it's for me. It's a personal pronoun for me, not for my parent, not for my pastor, not for my neighbor, not for my sister, brother, my spouse. For me, you've got to answer that question. For me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Oh, I was very grateful that Amy was willing to even give us a glimpse of her pain when she was answering that question about Mike. And I remember those moments uh, when we didn't know where Mike was, and we were pinging his phone, and the news was coming very slowly out of West Africa. And then when CBS News caught the story, that, that video clip that you just saw uh, earlier uh, of Mike teaching, when CBS News did their report, they included what you saw. That wasn't a snippet that was inside of a church service. Well, it was when it was filmed. But in Mike's death, Millions, probably a hundred plus million people were exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sure, of course. <clears throat> you, you know, pain is for real. Sometimes as Christians, we gather on Sundays like this and the painful moments in life that push in on us, 
you know, we try to cover it up, put on our Sunday best, put our smile on, even though, right, we've become disconnected with our grown children, or perhaps you fought on your way in this morning and things at the house aren't going so well, the pressure of the economy, whatever it is, pain is for real. The question is, is who will become the source, who will become the solution for your pain? Mike came to a place, Amy's come to a place where they found that source in Jesus Christ. It's not just a cliche. It's not just something that a pastor says on a Sunday morning. The pressure points of life are real. The great debate has always been about who will you allow to be your source. One of our challenges in the West isn't poverty. It's prosperity. And you are your source. You have figured it out. And you've got a full refrigerator inside the house and a full refrigerator in the garage. i got multiple cars. Maybe the joy that's missing from our life. Maybe this morning if we would just in a closing prayer between you and God say, you know God, I'm, I'm done trying to be my own source and I'm inviting you, Jesus Christ, to be the source, the supply of my life. Did you catch what Amy talked about her plans. Uh, they had the plans, right, where they built this village. We were a part of building that village. We were a part of connecting with the University of Florida, University of Tennessee, and their engineering and their agricultural departments, and going out in the Agua pa, uh, uh, Padre, how do you say that? Agua, someone help me out. Ponics, right? And hydro, growing stuff where no one's supposed to grow stuff, okay? And then all of a sudden, the plans changed because of the terrorist attack and the universities and the students' families didn't want them to travel. And you've got plans. So, some of you are already living in a plan B, a plan C, a plan D. It hasn't turned out exactly how you thought it was going to be. And the question sometimes is, well, where, where is God? And that's a very fair question to ask. Somewhere deep down in our core, having a centeredness. What does it mean to be a Christ follower? Is somewhere deep down in our core, even when life's plans get twisted, turned, changed, abused, God's got a plan. And his plans are good. And I don't always understand his plans. But I trust him. The old hymn writer was right. Trust and obey. There is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. I wonder if some of us are sitting on the sidelines of life right now because, quite correct, our plans, they aren't exactly what we thought, what we wanted, what we hoped for. This is not where I thought I would be. I thought, I thought this would have happened already. Or this certainly wouldn't have happened in my life. Will you trust God this morning in your plan? And then purpose. I, I know it's a word that's just flung around in life today. What is your purpose, right? And books are authored. And, but life is not a dress rehearsal. I wish somehow there was a way that God could give me the capacity to teach that. One of the great gifts of being a pastor is I'm reminded every week of the frailty of life. What is your life? It's but a vapor. It's here for a little bit of time, and then it vanishes away. Mike lived on purpose. Mike and Amy were living. I was their pastor. It's 2005. Very successful boat builders. Home, South Florida. They had it all. But you heard what Amy said. The greatest, most satisfying place that you'll ever be in your life 
is in the center of God's will. Wherever that might be, however much cash that might be, whatever square foot the house might be, whoever might be living in the White House, it, the greatest source of satisfaction will always be when you know in your heart that I'm right here in the center of God's will. And all of this, your pain and your plans and your purposes, understand it, it all is about a person. The Apostle Paul said, as for me to live is Christ. Christ is not a religion. Christ is not a denomination. Christ is not a strategy. Jesus Christ is the personhood of God who became flesh. He was tempted in every way that we've tempted, yet he conquered our greatest fear, death. He looked at it in the eyeballs and says, I win you lose so I know there's things in life to fear it's real we're not going to pretend that they're not I used to stand on platforms like this and say, you know what fear? Fear is false evidence appearing real all kinds of little cliches to try to convince you it ain't real I'm going to tell you something fear is for real question is who are you trusting to go through it to get over it to be victorious through it there are a lot of sources social media will offer you solutions marketers will offer you solutions politicians I am telling you the only singular source his name is is Jesus Jesus Christ and so before we step off this campus and enjoy Independence Day independence in this life to live free the ultimate independence is from the reality of sin that tries to minimize and marginalize our lives and you can have hope and freedom in Jesus and I'll pray that over you this morning. I also, as we, as we begin to go forward, you know, a, a church, I realize when I say the word church, in many ways, depending on your background and your experience, all kinds of thoughts come to your mind. Unfortunately, too often, the idea of, of institutions and denominations, but at, at best described, a church is a, is a family. And... I'm in, a, I'm in a biological family. We have a bloodline, Linda and I, and, and two daughters. Both my parents have passed. Linda's dad's passed, but Linda's mom's still living, and there are brothers and sisters, and there are cousins. What we have in common that brings us together as a family is we have this shared DNA, this, this bloodline, and you're in a family. But what we also share together this morning is another bloodline that we share in common, and it's the bloodline of Jesus. When he shed his blood, all who believe in him are now adopted into God's family. We now become spiritual family members. And just as in a physical, biological family, right, you, you manage time and you manage finances and you have budgets, and as a church family, right, we, we have a budget and we, we, our budget runs from July or from August 1st to July 31st. So we're ending this year, this fiscal uh, budget. And, and you know, it's, it's frustrating. Everything costs more right now. I'm living in the same place that you live. Uh, a lot of you, right, when it goes to, to renew your homeowner's insurance, you're, you're being told, right, that your roof is <laughs> too old and you got to put a new roof on, right? Kind of crazy. Uh, some of you volunteered about three, four years ago. We, we tried patching up this roof up here, right? And uh, it's been a booger bear. Now, I don't know if that's a Greek phrase, if that's an American phrase, booger bear. I hope it's not a cuss phrase. <laughs> but it's been a booger bear, right? And so, like, our, our roof is shot, and so we've been getting bids, and so it's going to cost us a, a buck 80, not a dollar and 80 cents. It's 180K uh, thousand. Aren't you glad your roof? doesn't cost you 180 to get it fixed. Here's the great things I love about our spiritual family. Because we give 
consistently, we believe everything we have belongs to God, we give consistently every single week. So that's called the storehouse. The money's in the storehouse, so the bill, the booger bear bill for $180,000, we don't operate as a church when I wait, I've got to give you some compelling story that if you don't give today, all the water's going to come in and destroy the building and you feel like a turd if you don't give. We don't, we don't exist that way. The <laughs> the contractor was that the contractor says, okay, listen, we can do terms and you know you can pay and in insurance. We said, no, thank you. What's the bill? We'll, we will write you a check for the bill. Right? That's why we're debt free. We we don't have any mortgage on this building. <laughs> for the purpose Hallelujah. to step in missionally, locally, and globally to be the difference. And so, yeah, we got pressing bills, and yeah, we've got things going on, but I think this is just, it starts with my opinion, because my name is Mark, and I, yeah, I, I get it, I'm the pastor, but I'm a part of this spiritual family. I know this, the ROI, the return on investments that we have given to Amy and Sheltering Wings over the years has been some of the best ROI that we've ever received. When, when you just go down from the, the, the orphanage uh, to the uh, women's center, uh, from the medical clinic. Listen, I get that there's pressures when it comes to your medical insurance and it's a real royal pain, right? When you're trying to get approval and how expensive it is and what it costs us, I get it. But let me say something. If you really want to see jacked up medical, leave America and go live someplace else. My Linda had some surgery this week, and as we, I was taking her home after, you know, recovery, and um, I looked at her and said, you realize no place in the world has this kind of care. Uh, Tommy Ball's watching online today from Advent Hospital. Love you, Tommy. Tommy, one of the uh, original partners in getting what we now know as Church of Hope started uh, 14 years ago. And Tommy's 84 years young, but he's having major spinal surgery on Tuesday. Only in America. And for us to step in and to provide medical care for these children at 2K a month, over a year, 24K, I would suggest to the Church of Hope, it's the best 24K we would spend in a year. So I'm going to, as I said to the first gathering, I'm, I'll hang out here. In a moment, I'll pray, and you all can go out and meet Amy and talk to Amy. And she's got some, some items there that the ladies in the um, women's village, the widow's village that they made, you can take home with you. If you don't think that's a good idea, come up here and tell me. Maybe, maybe I'm missing something. But it sure seems like that's an area we can, we can step in by faith and just make a difference. And listen, you already are making a difference. The street boys, the children are often just abandoned. And so these children end up in the major urban streets and they're running, they're trying to do little odd end jobs to make a little bit of money, right? Terrorists come in and then they recruit these boys by giving them food and shelter. And if they've hit the teenage years, girls. And they recruit them into doing real harmful things. So you, us, through Amy, they've got a team that goes down into the urban areas, finds those boys, brings them out to the center, gives them food, shelter. Now, we don't give the teenage boys girls, right? We don't do that. And then we give them Jesus. You are a part of you're making a difference in Ocala, Florida, and you're making a difference globally around the world. Hey, you've been sitting for a while. Why don't you stand with me? I'll pray over you. I think this weekend has, our time together has so framed in uh, who we are. And as you step out and have a great holiday weekend, if you get to have the day off tomorrow, enjoy it. But also be thinking about your life and your purpose. God has created every single one of us. Amy and Mike are not extraordinary. 
They are ordinary Christ followers who made one decision, all in. And you can read your Bible from cover to cover, all through the Old Testament, all through the New Testament, and I can't find any place where God says there's another option. One of the great tragedies in the West is somehow we've thought that you can follow Jesus, claim to be a Christ follower, sort of. You can tip him along the way. You can be, you know, you're a part of, yeah, you've added Jesus to your life, kind of like you add flavoring to your steak. He's involved. He's a part of it. He's what makes it taste better. Let me tell you something. Jesus is the steak. He's your plate. He's your knife. He's your fork. He's your napkin. He's your cup. He's your table. He's the breath. He's the chair. He's the floor. He's the soil. He's the ceiling. He's the sky. He is our all. So in this prayer, Christ followers, however God's talking to your heart and however you need to repivot your life and lean in and say, for me to live is Christ. Father in heaven, I love you. What a morning it's been. In the middle of this holiday weekend, you have showed up and you have met us. You've challenged us in your word. You've challenged us in the way that Amy is living out our life. Now, God, remove any thoughts of guilt. Remove any thoughts of we wish we could have, should have. Would you just remind all of us that we live in this present moment and you have called us to look forward in faith. Use each man and each lady today for your glory May we all live for you, Christ. May the new friendships that are going to take place out in the lobby as people talk to Amy and connect. As we take a little bit of the goods home that the ladies have made. May be a constant reminder that right here in Ocala, Florida, we are pushing back the evil. Pushing back the doubt. The disease of regret. That men and women, boys and girls, moms and dads, aunts and uncles and grandmas and grandpas, rich and poor, every ethnic group, no matter how somebody identifies themselves, what their preferences are, how they vote, how they live, that men and women will discover that the hope that they're looking for is found in your son, Jesus. We sure do love you. Bless these people as they follow after you as they make you, Jesus, the center, you, Jesus, the point of their life. It's in his name, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Peace.